Good evening. This is the second take. For some reason, I was before I was speaking into the void. Um, I hope it will work now. Anyway, welcome. I will talk about monads tonight. Yes, monads. Every technical YouTube channel or YouTube channel about programming at some point talks about monads. I will not have a very technical presentation. It will be more the intuition why monads could be useful and why you as an R programmer should maybe care about monads or maybe you shouldn't care about monads. You will be the judge. I will give a very, as I said, superficial presentation. It will be uh, something that I hope will give you the intuition. Uh, it won't be too technical. I won't be very precise as well with my uh, definitions and my terms because I, I think um, it's not necessarily useful here to understand what is going on. And I also want to stress that everything that I'm going to say here has already been said by other smarter people. And I will, at the end of the presentation, give you some links. Maybe let me let me zoom a little bit. I will give you some links um, for further reading, which I highly recommend you do if you are really interested into the topic. So monads. Um, what are monads? So if you've never heard about monads, let me just say that monads are a concept from functional programming. It's an, I think we could say an advanced concept, concept from functional programming that allow you to do things that functions have trouble doing. If you have already heard about monads and don't understand monads, I think this video might help you because I'm going to give you some code examples. And uh, again, very simple stuff, very into, I really focus on the intuition. So I think you could, uh, at the end of the video, have a clear idea of what monads, what, why they're useful, what are they about, okay? So to understand why we might need monads, I think it's good to start with uh, a question uh, or a discussion about imperative versus declarative programming. So imperative programming is the style of programming where you tell the computer exactly what to do. So you tell it where to look for values, you save a value in a new variable, then you run some loop where you detail the computation exactly. Whereas declarative programming or functional programming, well, you de declare the definitions of functions and then you tell the computer, well, use this function to do something. And the computer figures out what to do, just using the definition of the function. And the question we might ask is, well, why, why do we use functions? Why don't we simply use imperative programming always? And the reason, I, I will give you some example here of imperative code. I think it speaks for itself, but let's see. So let's suppose that we're looking at the Star Wars data set and we want to compute the average height of different groups of humans on one hand and of non-humans. So droids, aliens, this kind of thing on the other hand. So in an imperative way, I start by defining some empty values, some placeholders, and then I will loop over the rows of my data set and I need really to do everything. I need to specify everything. So I need to check, okay, are, is, is that row, is that row, uh, is there missing a missing value here for the species? Or because sometimes species is missing. If not, then uh, is, are, are they human? Okay, is that, is that character human? Yes. If yes, then you add its height or, yeah, his height or her height to some of humans and you increment the number of humans by one if it's uh, a non-human okay if it's another then then zero so basically zero if you have uh, a missing value and if it's a non-human then well uh, you just do the same thing but the non for the non-humans for the others okay so i think we already quite we see and understand why we don't really use imperative code that much because yeah as you see we have to run uh, a big loop with uh, if else and nested if elses. It's not very readable. Uh, it's a bit complex. Um, and yeah, so I didn't say that, but of course we can then compute the mean by just dividing the two uh, results we get. So it's a bit complicated, okay? Uh, so that's these are the problems of imperative code. So it's not really obvious what's going on. You have to read the loop and you have kind of in your head, let it run a little bit. 
um, unless it's commented, of course, unless there's like a block comment telling you what's going on, where I'm going on. It's not easily reusable. So if you want to change something, you really need to rewrite quite a lot of code. Uh, handling missing data uh, increases really the complexity. So you will see when we compare with the functional approach uh, here, the, the complexity is really increased by a lot. And if you have something else in your data going on, some other problem, you need to also deal with that manually and specifically. It's not something that you can easily test. So you have to kind of run it interactively by hand and, and look if the results make sense. So it's not easy to test in a programmatic way. And the worst offender is that it cannot be easily composed. And this will be a very important idea throughout all the presentation. So by composing or chaining, I mean being able to pipe functions one after the other. Composing is not exactly the same as piping, but for, for simplification purposes, let's say it's the same. So composing is some, for example, I do log of 10 and then this result, I take it and I, and I give it to square root. Okay, well, this is actually chaining. Composing, strictly speaking, would be to define a new function where I would first take the log of an argument and then the square root. And then this new function, I apply it to 10, but it's the same. It's the same. So composing, chaining, running functions one after the next. Very important concept. However, the imperative approach has the advantage that it only needs a handful of very fundamental building blocks. So you basically only need if else's and for loops, and you can do anything. Um, so that's that's nice because if you're learning other languages, as soon as you you learn for loops and if else's, you can do basically anything. So that's pretty. Really, that's really good. But if we compare now to the functional approach, uh, I think that uh, it will be quite obvious why we use functions. Okay, If you see here, the functional approach is three lines of code, and uh, it returns a data frame. Okay, So we don't even need to start with some empty values. It will hold the result, and we don't need to then define. And this I will also talk about this particular point, we don't need to define also uh, some kind of vessel to hold the results. We just get it for free. So the advantage is that it's obvious what's going on, if you know what aggregate does, of course, but if you don't know, you read its documentation and then you know forever. That's pretty nice. Uh, it's reusable, so you just, just need to replace the data set. Or if you want something else uh, than the mean, uh, you put something else here. So. It's very, very nice and very easy, very uh, easy to reuse. Missing values now are handled by mean, so simply uh, an option. And actually, because mean has an, an A.RM set to false by default, I had to define this anonymous function that redefines mean with an A.RM equal to. So that's obviously something more complex uh, because if you don't know what anonymous functions are, you don't really understand what's going on here. But once you know that, and once you know what aggregate does, well, you can you can just work. You can easily do redefine functions to set arguments, and you can just do whatever you need. Um, what else? Yeah, it's easy to test. And most importantly, it composes with other functions. So, for example, I have here. Uh, I piped this result to set names, to set some nice names for my data frame. And so now I know, well, is human, when it's false, I have a mean height of this. And when it's true, I have a mean height of that. And that's really important because if now we compare with how we would do that in an imperative world, well, uh, it's it seems, it seems like it's not a huge problem because it's just two lines. You could think, well, it's just two lines. You just add two lines, you define a new data frame with your results, and that's it. The problem, however, is if we look in, into more detail or if we think a little bit about that, this means that now we have to handle this, uh, this vessel to hold the results manually. And, and if we want, for example, to do something with these results, with these means, well, we have to write an, a new loop that takes this. I mean, it's not something that we could easily, we couldn't, we cannot take this loop over here and somehow just chain it to another loop 
and, and keep doing that and get an end result at the end. We have to save into intermediary variables and we have then to rewrite a new loop that deals with that. Or if we save that into a data frame, then we have to write a loop that works with the data frame. But if we save that into a list, we have to write another loop that works with a list. So it's not something that is so uh, easy, so obvious. Not great. So you have to manage this vessel that holds the results by hand. It's very error prone. By the way, did you notice I did a little mistake? Is human true, but I put the average height of the non-humans? And is human false, I put the average height of humans. And this, of course, can go unnoticed for ages. And here again, it's the result or it's the symptom or the, it's the consequence of doing that manually. So that's a, another problem. Functions, on the other hand, they have a well-defined return value. So if you know that your function returns a data frame, well, you get a data frame. If you know that your function returns whatever, a list, you get a list and you can work with that. So to summarize, functions are easy to test, easy to document, easy to package, and they are composable and chainable. However, there are situations where functions are not enough. And this is why I did this 11 minute long introduction on functions, even though everything I said until now, you probably know it. But now things have become interesting, I think. So functions, you cannot really use them if you need, if you have some extra needs. So if you need, for example, to time your code, or if you need to log it, or if you need to log what your functions did, or, or, or there are other things that, uh, other examples that you can think of. And we're going to look at how we're going to deal with timing code. So how would you time your code? Well, probably something like this. You would probably start by defining a variable tick, which takes the exact time uh, where it's run. Then you run this, and then you, you define talk at the end, and then you just compute the difference between talk and tick and you get your running time. Now, the problem with that is that we're basically back to square one because now we are mixing functional code, so your deploy uh, workflow, with this uh, TikTok stuff, and that's imperative. So the, the timing is done outside of the function in an imperative way, and the consequence is that we need, again, to keep manually track of it. And again, this does not compose. So if you want, for example, to time another deploy a workflow, then you need to save that in another variable, and then you need to add them together. So of course you can do it by hand, but it's annoying, you have to be careful, it's error prone. So what could be some solutions? So the first solution is really bad, but I'm showing it anyway. It's to redefine every function, and this we're going to need anyway, always, as you will see. We redefine the functions. So filter now becomes tick filter with some timing done around it. So tick filter gets wrapped. And we run, uh, we just show a message with the running time. So if we run Star Wars tick filter, now we get a running time and we get our table back. Now the problem with this is that we need to change every function. That's really not good. Uh, running time is now uh, only a message. So if we need that to, to compute something well, it's lost, or uh, unless we copy and paste it, which is even worse. However, the functions do compose because tick filter over here still returns a data frame, and this data frame could be passed to tick select, to tick group by, etc. So to other decorated functions. Okay. Solution number two. So instead of showing a message, we could return the running time as an element of a list. So the function now returns a list. The function now returns a list where the first element is the result. So it's, again, the original function evaluated on its arguments and a running time. Now, if we run Star Wars tick filter and we save that in result solution two, what do we get? Well, we get a list, okay, where the first element is our data frame and the second element is the running time. So now, we solve the problem with we have another. First of all, we still need to change every function. Second of all, they don't compose now because now tick filter, right? This one returns, as you see, a list. And this list, if I give that to tick select, well, tick select expects a data frame. 
tick select does not expect a list where the first element is a data frame. So I cannot chain them. I cannot compose this function. So that's a huge problem. But at least we save the running time now. So we can continue working with it. So that's pretty good. Now, third solution, using a global variable. So um, this one is very similar to the others. The start is always the same, but we have a further argument called running time, which by default will be zero. And we use this uh, double arrow to save running time into the global environment. So this double arrow, what it does is when you run, uh, or rather when you save a variable inside the body of a function with this double arrow, this double arrow makes it available, this variable makes, it, uh, makes this variable available in the global environment. So every other function can now access it. Meaning that we can do things like that. We can say, well, running time is zero. That's the start. Now I run my tick filter. And if I check running time now, I have something higher than zero, okay? Now, uh, if I run tick select, which I defined, but I didn't show you, um, well, running time now is not zero, but is this thing. And I get this result now. And remember this result is the running time of my function plus the global running time. So now if I run functions one after the other, my running time gets incremented. So if I have a, if I have a workflow, a huge dplyr workflow of these functions, at the end, my running time will be the total of every function. Okay, so that's pretty nice. Um, but we still need to change every function. But the functions compose because what they return is a data frame, so we can chain them. But these functions are not pure. They're not pure because they're changing something outside their scope. They're saving a variable into the global environment. And this is very error prone. This is really difficult to manage because you have to mentally keep track of it. Uh, if you rerun a chunk because maybe you notice the typo or something, then, well, your global variable running time gets incremented. But now you have to rerun everything again because you, you, rerun a, you reran a chunk and now uh, the, your, your running time this contains one run that too much. Uh, so this is a problem. So you have to keep track of it. And uh, yeah, it's not ideal. It's really not ideal. So what is, what is actually the solution to solve this? What, what can we do to uh, overcome these shortcomings of functions? It turns out that we need more functions. So, and we need to solve two problems. We need to, the first problem is changing everything, every function always by hand. We don't want that. We don't want to redefine every function like we did here with tick filter. Uh, where is it? Yeah, doing that for each function. We don't want to do that. Um, and the second uh, problem we need to solve is we need whatever we're going to do, we need it to be composable. That's super important. And it turns out that the solution is actually some kind of a mixture of a two and three. Okay. So the first problem, changing all these functions by hand, can be solved with what we call function factories. So I will link in the description a link um, on, I think it's a chapter of Advanced R that discusses function factories. And function factories are functions that return functions. And that's exa exactly what we need. So we're going to write a function called timeit. And what timeit does, it takes a function as an input Okay, as an argument, it takes also the arguments of, of dot f and the running time, just like in solution tree, the running time is now an argument of this function. And what it returns, well, it, as you see, it returns a function that wraps dot f around TikTok, okay? And returns a list just like solution two, returns a list with the result and with the running time. And as you see, this is the same definition as in solution tree. So it's tick-tock, okay, the difference of tock and tick over here, plus a running time that we can pass to the function. Doing that, passing this running time to the function and not redefining here some global variables makes this function pure. Strictly speaking, actually, it's not pure because, um, so a pure function is a function that one doesn't change anything outside of its scope, but also returns exactly always the same result for the same inputs. And this function does not do that because running time will change because 
even if you run here, uh, if you have filter over here, and even if you run filter with exactly the same arguments, the running time will not exactly always exactly be the same, okay? Because your computer, uh, in theory, it in theory it would, should be exactly the same. What happens? In theory, it should be exactly the same. In in practice, it won't be. Okay, in practice, it won't be exactly the same. So, it, but doesn't really matter for our purposes over here. Now, we can define functions very easily thanks to this uh, time it function. If I want to time square root, I just need to call time it square root, and then I have this t square root of ten, and I get this nice result, which is a list with my result and with my running time. However, we have now a problem. These functions don't compose. These timed functions, as I call them, they don't compose because, as I said before, this t sqrt returns a list, but t log expects a number. t log does not want a list. So t log doesn't know how to basically grab this result element here and use that and how to grab this running time and add it to its own running time. So what can we do to solve this? So uh, we need to define composability for these timed functions. And we can do that using a helper function that we're going to call bind. And we're going to call it bind because in this functional programming world, or literature, that's how they call it. So bind is actually quite simple. Uh, it takes a list. So this is my list of result and of running time. It takes a timed function. So this is a timed function now. Okay, one of these decorated functions, and further arguments to uh, this timed function. And what it does is that it grabs the result element inside a list, feeds it to dot f, feeds this dot to f, so these are the further arguments to f, and the running time as well. So it grabs the running time and it gives it to the timed function. Why? Because if you remember what time it does, it needs this argument over here. And as you see here, there's the dot running time and here it's running time. Okay. And this basically ensures that the running time will be summed up. Okay. So that's why, uh, that's why bind over here. Uh, oh, I'm going to, I'm going back. Bind over here takes the running time to give it to this function so that it can be summed up, okay? So that the running times can be summed up. And now that we have bind, we can, oh yeah, so this is what I just said. So bind takes a list returned by a time function plus a time function. So it fishes the result element from the list, gives it to the time function and the same for running time, for summing up. And now what do we have here? Well, we have the possibility of composing them. We can take 10, give it to square root to time square root and we can now bind t log and now we get the result plus the sum of the running times and what is really nice with this approach is that we can use it for any function yeah i use it for dplyr functions i save this into end result i run my my workflow my dplyr workflow as usual here, I don't need to use bind because tfilter expects this data frame, so it gets a data frame, but then tfilter returns a list. So here I need to bind, and then this will return as a list as well. So I need to bind again, bind, 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 and so on and so on. And if I look at end result, I do get my end result, and I do get a running time, which is the sum of every running time. So this is how we could solve this problem. Now, we're finally, finally, after 24 minutes, we can talk about monads. Now we have every ingredient to learn what monads are. Are you ready? You actually know what monads are because everything I showed you until now is a monad. Yes. So the solution <laughs> described before is actually a monad. What, so what's a monad? So a monad is not one thing that you can point your finger and say this is a monad well actually yes but that's what confuses people for a monad you need several ingredients you need a function factory that creates this decorated function so this timed functions as i said um, and these functions return a special wrapped value so the wrapped value in our case was a list 
but it could be something else. It could be a more complex object. And this value is also called a monadic value. And we need a way to compose these decorated functions. This was what we used bind for. Bind allowed us to do that. And once we have that, we kind of have a monad, not yet, because we need some ingredients that I didn't talk about, but I don't think they're needed for the uh, intuition. So we would need fmap and join. By the way, list the list itself, the list is actually also a monad. And uh, fmap for lists is just called map, as in curve. That's just a little aside. And I won't go into details, but it turns out list is also uh, a monad. Um, anyway, a monad is, is, this, is, is a way to, first of all, get these decorated functions and then to wrap them. And usually use a monad or you use monads to deal with this kind of... Uh, of, of, uh, of problems that I showed you. So whenever you, you kind of need to play around with the global environment, that might be a sign that you need a monad, okay? Because you're probably uh, doing some things that are not really pure. So you're overwriting something in the global environment or you're running, maybe you want to run functions with options that you want to set into the global environment. Uh, or things like that. This is where monads can be useful. And there's also, uh, for example, the maybe monad uh, that I will also actually link, you will see in my slides. So the maybe monad is a monad where the functions return a maybe value. So maybe they return a result, maybe they return nothing. And if they return nothing, uh, you, you, you can continue working with that in a way. So, so your, your programs don't throw an error, just stop. So you, you explicitly manage errors. So here the wrap value is kind of a, of a, of a box where you, maybe you have a value, maybe you have nothing. I will link uh, some resources in the description and also in my slides so you can take a look at this maybe monad. So yes, yeah, should you use monads? Well, maybe if you're again, if you're working, if you if you are, uh, for example, wrapping functions because you want to uh, log what they're doing, or you want to time them, and uh, or if you're writing functions that overwrite something in the global environment, maybe you could consider uh, implementing a monad for them, or maybe not. Uh, I mean, ninety nine percent. Point nine of uh, our programmers don't use monads. I actually don't use monads yet in my daily work. I probably will. I actually implemented a monad myself. I will talk a little bit about it uh, in a couple of minutes. So I think I will, but I totally understand why mo most people wouldn't, uh, because it's definitely a bazooka. It's definitely overkill. It's a bazooka to kill a fly, but it's it allows you to be very strict uh, with your code and to avoid some uh, problematic situations. So depending on what you're doing, uh, it might be definitely worth the effort. So some further reading. Uh, I, so there's this, fur, this great blog post about the baby mode that, as I, as I talked about a little bit earlier, that I highly recommend. There's also a maybe monad package developed by Andrew McNeil. Uh, Great package, very high quality code. Highly recommend you check out the source code and you check out how the package works as well. So you can click on this blue uh, blue words are our links. There's also this nice video uh, that actually inspired me for these slides, uh, which I really find very interesting. You definitely should watch it. Uh, and there's uh, the category theory for programmer courses by uh, Bartos Milewski. Uh, so category theory is kind of, I would say, the uh, underlying theory behind functional programming, maybe. I don't know if that's the correct definition. Probably not. Um, but it's great because this is really the mathematics behind uh, behind monads, behind functors, behind uh, morphisms, behind all this stuff um, that you can then implement uh, in, in your code. And it's great to really, if you really want, if you really want to go into the nitty gritty details, definitely recommend you check out the videos. And then there's this other blog post that I found very, very nice, very interesting that I highly recommend you check out. This functor, functors, applicatives, and monads in pictures. So I didn't talk about functors, I didn't talk about applicatives, but if you check out this blog post, you will be up to speed. 
Now, some self-promotion. As I said, I have developed, uh, or rather, I have implemented a monad for logging, which also logs uh, running time or execution time. Uh, and you can check it out. And we're, that's what we're going to do in, in just two minutes. So what what uh, Chronicler does is, uh, well, basically what I showed you, uh, it provides this record function that allows you to decorate your functions. And then you have bind record, so which is the bind from before, that allows you to chain them. And then when you create an object B, for example, here, you can then read the log of B, and you can see what happens. So you see that square root ran successfully, then the uh, ex exponential, then the mean, etc., and you have the total running time. And you can then also pick the value and get the value out of B. Uh, you can do that with deploy functions, as I showed you. Uh, you can get a log. Um, and uh, you can also use this pipe uh, that I have implemented with some help, I must say. Um, instead of using bind all the time, uh, you can use this new pipe that does the binding for you. And you get your results and you get, of course, your uh, log. This uh, chronicler object, so these outputs that I defined here, this output pipe object, they are, let me maybe zoom in a little bit. Um, they have a, a print method, a dedicated print method that shows you that this is uh, a, a chronicler object, the value was computed successfully, and it tells you what you can do with this object, that you can read the log and you can also pick the value. What is also interesting is that um, there's some condition handling. Uh, so for example, here I have a typo, so this is not a column that exists in Star Wars. So now my object as nothing, so it's uh, the, the value computed unsex uh, unsuccessfully. And if I read the log, I see what failed and also with which exception. So that's, I think, pretty useful. And there's some other options that I won't go into detail now, some other stuff that you can do. Uh, but anyways, uh, this is a monad, which I think I will, I will use. So this is not yet on CRAN. I am still working on adding some more functionality. Uh, I asked a friend to work on the logo, so I also want a logo uh, before it's on CRAN, and I will publish it on CRAN soon, uh, probably maybe ne maybe this month already, and, uh, and then I personally will use it because this will be really useful for what I do. I hope it could also be useful for you, so if you use it, if you find it useful, let me know, and if you have suggestions, don't hesitate um, to, to leave a comment. In any case, I hope that you found my little presentation useful, that now you have some intuition for what are monads. By the way, this video is actually, or this presentation is actually uh, uh, a presentation that I did uh, from a blog post. So I, have a bl I wrote a blog post with all the code, with all the explanations. So you can also check out the blog post, which I will link into the description. And yeah, I hope you enjoyed. And um, if you have some more questions, ask them. I'll try to answer to the best of my knowledge. In any case, see you soon and have a good one.